Hello, and welcome to the eTech Podcast with me, your host, Ryan Morn. I have been involved in the development of electrified vehicles and machines since 2005 as an engineer and a business leader. This podcast is the product of my passion for electric and autonomous vehicle technology. I'm here to share knowledge from some of the world's leading experts, as well as my own insights. Join me as we accelerate the transition to cleaner, safer and smarter vehicles and grow the industry around the world. On this episode, we're going to talk about supercapacitors, and this is in response to a listener request for more information on this topic. It's a bit old. Uh, It has taken us a little while to get around to answering this. So sorry, Stefan. I would have loved to have done this earlier, but we just had other things coming up in the in the meanwhile. But thank you for coming in with a question and a reminder to other people that um, despite the fact it's taken us a long time to answer this question this time, we do welcome your questions and we do want to help try and answer things that you want to know in terms of EV powertrain um, and EV technology. I think uh, this question originally came in from Stefan um, at a time when Tesla had just announced they were going to acquire a supercapacitor company called Maxwell uh, in a deal that valued Maxwell at about $200 million. Uh, Maxwell was a pretty sizable business at the time, around 380 employees, annual revenues of about $100 million. Uh, You know, it was making a loss, so it wasn't profitable at the time. They were investing a lot of money in research and development and such like. But, you know, $200 million valuation on the face of it might seem pretty low for a $100 million turnover business in comparison to some other deals happening in the EV space. So, you know, we're going to look at why did the stakeholders go for this? What were Tesla interested in? And we're going to do a bit of a deep dive. But first of all, just in case people were wondering, let's talk about what actually is a supercapacitor. So a capacitor is an energy storage device. It uses electrostatic energy storage. Um, So a battery, which everyone, I guess, is familiar with by now. So a battery is an electrochemical uh, storage device. So in a a battery, basically, there's chemistry going on inside there to store the energy um, and then release the energy. In a supercapacitor, it's a bit like when you rub a balloon on your hair, um, as I'm sure everyone does all the time, and it makes your hair stand stand on end. Or if you're wearing um, nylon clothes and you touch someone and you get an electric shock, That is static electricity, and a supercapacitor has a construction inside of it which allows it to store a lot of uh, static electricity inside the device. So that means supercaps can be more robust and handle more power than a battery because there's no electrochemical reactions to worry about. Uh, So, you know, putting power in and out can happen much more quickly. There is a catch, obviously, otherwise uh, supercapacitors will be powering everything. Uh, and that is that while supercaps are great at power, they've got not very good energy density and they do lose charge as well over time. So you get sort of charge leakage from them. So they've got their limitations as an energy storage device. But what they're really good at is that quick instantaneous hits of power. So from that... Um, If we look at where Maxwell's revenues were coming from and and really what was happening in their traditional markets. So Maxwell, they're pretty, you know, if you're into uh, supercaps or EVs, Maxwell, pretty famous company. They're definitely not a startup. I mean, these guys have been around for about 50 years. They had some pretty big existing markets for their products. So, you know, $100 million, that's some decent scale. Uh, And principally, these would be, uh, in the automotive side, uh, stop-start systems. So in a 12-volt uh, car, you've got a normal lead-acid battery. And in modern cars, to get uh, fuel consumption up and emissions down, uh, we've gone to stop-start systems. So the engine stops when you're in traffic, and that's fine. And then the engine restarts. That's, it's got to crank it quickly to get it to restart. In some cases, in uh, some, some cars, the 12-volt battery needs a bit of help. So basically, in, in, in those kind of applications, what people or some, some manufacturers started doing was putting supercapacitors over the battery to help um, give a bit of a boost. And that was in cars, but then also particularly in trucks. So in the heavy-duty truck market, now anyone listening in Europe is probably at this point going, what? Trucks are all 24 volts, so commercial vehicles are 24 volt in Europe. But in the US, most heavy-duty trucks are still 12 volts. Uh, Obviously, if you're trying to crank over a massive 15-litre diesel engine, that takes a huge amount of current at 12 volts. Um, And 
uh, it had been found that putting supercapacitors into these systems helped the um, helped the lead acid batteries to perform better and last longer and helped uh, get better, more consistent starting in all kinds of different conditions. So uh, supercaps to support stop-start systems uh, is a big market for the Maxwell product. Now, I think uh, an issue here potentially is that this has been a good market, but it's likely to decline, uh, particularly as 48 volt um, mild hybrid systems come in. So in, in th these kind of systems, which are being looked at for a lot of truck and a lot of passenger car applications, um, basically the stop start cranking is not done from the 12 volt system anymore. It's done from the 48 volt battery. So in that case, there's much less current um, going through the system. So it makes life a little bit easier in terms of all that cold weather starting, etc. And you've got more power available potentially. So that stop-start market um, is likely to be uh, cannibalized a bit by uh, newer technologies coming in. Uh, then the other place where Maxwell's supercapacitors were used is in full hybrid electric and in uh, some uh, rail applications and even fuel cell applications, where basically what, what was happening was the supercapacitors were being used to Either, either by themselves in some cases. So with rail, for example, uh, super, caps, super caps were being used by themselves as uh, short-term energy storage, but then, you know, the train was getting the, the majority of its power through the, the pantograph or through the rails, so it didn't really need much storage, but just short-term energy recovery was, was helping the performance of the train. Um, in other applications in, in uh, buses and larger vehicles, you know, if, if this was kind of 10-year-old battery technology, so you've got batteries in these vehicles, uh, lithium batteries probably, but where you couldn't handle a huge current flow in and out of the battery. So so a large capacity battery pack, um, so it's got good energy storage, but where the super cap came in is to basically peak shave or deal with the high power um, draws and uh, sinks into the battery that might occur under things like regen braking, under vehicle deceleration, or under really hard acceleration events. Um, so again, this market is kind of probably fading away a bit, I think, as improved lithium batteries take out these needs for super caps in the, in the system. Uh, you know, the old sort of PO4 uh, lithium batteries that people used to use back, you know, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, they're, they're less common now, getting to much better energy dense batteries, but we've got sort of comfortable 3C power ratings. Um, so we, we're getting now the energy ratings and the cycle life out of uh, more conventional battery cells in these heavy duty applications. So again, that kind of big bit of Maxwell's current market probably being eroded um, somewhat by advances in battery technology. So then that does, of course, pose a question. Um, I mean, it might, that probably answers why Maxwell were keen to sell, but it does probably pose the question of what else could Tesla be buying Maxwell for? Now, I think there's probably two drivers, possible drivers for this deal. One has been talked about a lot. I don't think the second has been talked about very much at all. So the first thing um, that a big deal has been made of is uh, the dry battery electrode technology that Maxwell had developed. So basically, this was a manufacturing process technology that Maxwell uh, created in order to make manufacturing their super caps um, more efficient and more effective. But at some point, someone went, aha, we can apply this to manufacturing lithium batteries as well as making super caps. And this uh, dry battery electrode technology, what it does is uh, basically when normally when you're making a conventional lithium battery, you have to coat uh, the electrodes um, with carbon. And uh, and that process, it's done with a, it's kind of like a, a wet and uh, it's not casting it's like a almost like a coating process but it's done as a wet process with solvents it's not a very nice process at all the the maxwell process for this is is a really clever dry process so basically they mix the carbon together with a polymer binder uh, mush it all up uh, they stick that through a rolling press and then they roll it onto and it, it makes a film and then they roll that film onto the electrode material and that makes a really good, very uh, thick, actually relative to the casting process, uh, a, a electrode. Uh, so it's it's an excellent process for coating battery electrodes. Potentially takes some cost out of the manufacturing process of the battery. It means you've got a really a, a, a nice coating structure on the battery electrodes 
and Maxwell demonstrated some pretty decent benefits uh, as to the performance and energy density that you could get out of this. So a good step forwards. I, I think the battery so still needs a liquid electrolyte, so it's not going to be solid state. So if you hear people talking about solid state, that's not what this is. Um, this is still a, effectively a, a liquid electrolyte battery system. But there were some pretty impressive gains made through the um, through the application of this dry electrode manufacturing process, um, and I think that so solid state is still a little bit away away from the market. There's some issues in terms of production readiness. There's it, a lot of issues in terms of scale manufacturing, durability with differential thermal expansion, etc. In solid state cells, so actually having the wet cell, so there are some clear drawbacks to the liquid electrolyte, but there are some advantages right now. So if this could give quite a good incremental jump forwards um, for battery manufacturing, this would be a really big thing. And it would be worth easily 200 million um, to Tesla in order for them to get this advantage. I'm going to put a link uh, in the show notes to a really cool paper I found from Maxwell discussing this, uh, discussing this technology and the kind of benefits that they were measuring in lithium batteries from uh, from using this. It's it's re- it's worth a read. Really is worth a read. It's a pretty interesting technology. Pretty in, in a way, a very simple approach. But you know, of, often the best things are really simple. So uh, take a look at that down below in the show notes. So I said two things. So there is another thing. I think the second possible use of supercaps in an EV, and and maybe why Tesla are interested, is basically the complete opposite of something I was just saying earlier, in that (laughs) one of the historic applications for supercaps has been to provide high power density energy storage, often supporting high energy dense, uh, high energy density, but low power density battery systems. Now, current battery technology, we've got to quite a nice point in terms of power and energy density, but the generally accepted view is that energy density continues to improve, power density falls, because basically the way that we get energy density up in a battery is by adding more and more and more active surface area, and essentially that means because a battery is a laminated structure, to get more active surface area, we have to have thinner and thinner sheets of material. So the problem with that is if we're trying to pass large currents through the pack, it's not great doing that with super thin, super thin material. So in more energy dense battery systems, and particularly people have talked about this a lot with um, a lot with solid state batteries, there could be a real need to support the pack through through supercaps. So basically you'd combine supercapacitors and a lithium battery and that you sort of get the best of both worlds in terms of a really, really energy dense um, battery, but then with the power, uh, power handling capability over the top of that. Uh, so, so that, you know, that could be an application in terms of supporting, um, supporting the, the, the power factor. So, t- you know, typically... If you're looking at a battery, we've got other podcasts about battery technology and cells and all the rest of it. So I'm not going to get into it at all here. You can go back and have a look at some of those in the archives. The um, We talk about C rating with a battery and basically high energy density batteries. So you get a lot of energy in them, but they tend to have lower C rates. But we're normally around about 3C. So what that means is we can push and pull three times the capacity um, of the battery in kilowatts in and out. So for example, a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack rated at 3C, we'd be able to push and pull 300 kilowatts in and out of it. And being careful to uh, to remember about the hours when we go from capacity to power. So, you know, we can see the, the correlation there and obviously some bigger EV drivetrains. Uh, I think the main thing that's uh, maybe bigger EV uh, rapid charging systems. You know, we want to hit it, but then we want to hit it for a long time when it's on a rapid charge. So probably, probably not really on a rapid charge side, but you know, higher performance vehicles were pushing and pulling a lot of current in and out, and um, and maybe there's a need in terms of supporting, um, supporting the battery in in that way. So I did say two things, but uh, as we talk through this, there is one other thing. So w- one last thing. So one f- finally, one final thing. Uh, Another application in an EV where Maxwell's skills uh, and some of what they can do might be useful to Tesla uh, that springs into my mind. So in an EV, all of the power electronic devices that you've got, uh, the traction inverter, the DC-DC converter and the battery charger have in them uh, something or some things called DC link capacitors. So basically these are 
huge lumpy capacitors that sit in those devices and they help, uh, they sit on the DC um, supply in and out and they help to smooth that out. Um, so these are one of the most expensive components in, in the power device. Traditionally, DC link capacitors are large film capacitors. These are really heavy. Uh, they can be a weak point in the power device from a reliability point of view. They don't really like getting hot, for one thing. And I can imagine that improving the performance of a DC link capacitor might be something of interest, um, particularly if you're making a lot of your own power electronics devices. And Tesla are a bit unusual in that, in that they, um, as an OEM, they do all their own inverters and things like that, whereas a lot of other OEMs choose to buy inverters and uh, power electronics in from sub-suppliers. So um, at the moment, there's lots of issues around the supply of DC link capacitors. There's a shortage of supply globally and lead times are long. So improving the DC link capacitor would be a really beneficial thing to do. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, it was probably not the main reason, I would say, uh, but I can imagine it being something we are, oh, okay, we've got people who know a lot about capacitors, uh, particularly these really high-performance supercapacitors. Um, potentially, could you use a supercapacitor as a DC link capacitor? Um, I can't answer that right now in my head. If anyone else knows, shout. I have a suspicion that you probably could. Um, super caps tend to have a lower voltage limit. You're going to end up with more of them. Uh, hmm. Okay, one to think about. But definitely in terms of if you want some experts in capacitor manufacturing, capacitor process optimization, the Maxwell guys are probably the best in the world for that. So it is a big component in the power electronics devices in an EV. Um, so, right, uh, with that three out of two things, so an extra bonus uh, thing on the end there, that's all we've got time for today. Um, so thank you very much for listening and uh, taking the time out. Um, quite a short podcast today, which is unusual for me. I managed to stop myself from uh, rambling on, and I'm not going to spoil that now by doing that now. Please don't forget to leave us a rating um, or a comment. Hit like, um, or do, you know, depending on which platform you're listening to us on, we really appreciate that. Uh, there's going to be more exciting episodes coming soon. We've got some really great interviews lined up. I've just done a couple. Uh, fantastic. Really excited about those and getting those out. Uh, really, really interesting. Talking about future EV technology with some experts in the industry. So they are coming. So don't forget to subscribe to make sure that you get those soon. Um, and I really look forward to talking to you again soon.